So from a chat show to a live debate, it's engineers versus educators. I feel like we should have some rocky music or something uh, behind me. Um, so we're going to be discussing how we can get more women into STEM roles, the disparity between that desire and um, the educational prerequisites that maybe deter and, and prevent women from going in that direction and the value of learning on the job. So let's get our speakers up here then. We'll start with uh, the engineering side of things. So please welcome Rasheen McHenry, Head of Production Technology, Timeline TV. <laughs> Sandy is now Solution Architect, Telstra Broadcast Services. Thank Sandy. You. And Paris Hughes, Design Engineer, Emerging Technologies and Sky. <laughs> welcome to you all. Um, right, and the educators genuinely feel like I'm on fight night. Um, right, um, Polly Hickling, course leader for the Media Technology Programme and Solent University of Southampton. Susan Pratt, Director of Teaching and Learning, Department of Music and Media, Film and Video Production Technology, University of Surrey. And last but not least, Dr. Ajaj Ali, course director, Digital Television Technology and Degree Apprenticeships from Ravenclaw. Evening, ladies, and the brave gentlemen at the end. <laughs> well done. Um, it's good to have you all up here. It's great, actually. Um, and I want to start um, by asking by asking you guys about a question that was actually raised from the audience last year, and it came from Susan, <laughs> and um, it triggered something of an argument. So let's start with that then. Um, we'll start with that issue straight away. So. Universities are complaining that they're not attracting enough female students, and that's possibly triggered by um, their exam results, prerequisites. Um, so I just want to find out from the educators first, um, what is the situation now um, from the university side on that issue? And I think we should start with you, Susan, given mm. that you brought up the subject uh, last year. So my overall question was about how can we actually get more people interested in the technical side of television? The all know about the people in front of the screen, they know about things from media studies, so they've got an idea of what that is, it's a real thing, it's something tangible, they see it, but they don't see what's going on behind the scenes, that's not real to them, it's not a profession, it's not a job. So when they're looking through their perspectives of what, what am I going to do at university, oh media studies, oh that's the person in front of the screen, that's learning about communication, so this is where I felt there was a mismatch. And if we can let people to understand what a great and exciting career there is behind the scenes, then we could inspire more people to actually do the maths and the physics or the science or the IT to actually be, become part of that industry. So we do that um, by not asking them to get certain grades and doing certain subjects? Is, is that what what you want? Or, or uh, every course at every university will need some kind of prerequisite to, to apply to the course, to do that particular course. Um, so it's not a matter of what we are setting, but if we are doing an engineering degree, an engineering degree has to actually complete certain functions. Therefore, if you <laughs> want to be accredited by the IET, your course has to have maths and science, it has to have engineering analysis, has to have design, and have engineering practice. Those are the things that benchmarks an engineering course. So it does need to be part of the course. Dr. Jess, what's your, what's your take on this? Yeah, I fully agree with that. Of course, you have to meet certain benchmarks. But for particularly about broadcast engineering, I don't think there's shortage of women. There is complete shortage. Uh, that is because students normally go for more glamorous. What they see is in front of the screen. Mm -hmm. Behind the screen is never shown to them. They don't even know there is a career in that which maybe is more paid than what is in front of the screen. So I think communication is the key in that, uh, reaching out to people and telling them, yes, there is a career in broadcast engineering. Let alone women, as I said, we, we, we really struggle to recruit students for overall, even boys as well. So an alternative route to that is, I think, degree apprenticeships, where the employer actually chooses who they want to recruit. And rather than leaving it to the university to decide, uh, at a certain benchmark, the employer takes them on board, they send them to university to meet that, meet that bench, benchmark criteria, and then we just uh, train them on those elements. It has worked really well. Uh, we work with BT and few other uh, apprenticeship providers. We have got, uh, in one class, 50-50 ratio. Uh, in another class, we have one-third 
uh, women uh, students and the rest are male. So it is encouraging them and the engineers actually, the broadcast industry actually going out to them and supporting them rather than leaving it to the educational institutions only. Our responsibility is to benchmark and of course we have to meet certain criteria and that is very important. We're going to be getting on to the apprenticeships now, uh, later. Um, I feel like this is going to be very nice, actually, because I feel like you're all going to agree, which is no fun at all. Um, but um, let's go to you guys then. Rasheen, we, we had a little chat, didn't we, about you know what was needed to, to get into the universities here to study engineering. Um, how did you get into the to the business first thing? Was it something that you always wanted to do? No, uh, we did river dance. Uh, I love the studio. <laughs> that, that, that's it. I was going to be an accountant. Um, no, and 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 I saw a documentary about the making of river dance and saw the behind the scenes. Went, that's great. I'll do that then. Um, and I went to at the time because I'm nearly dead. Uh, I went to uh, a university because my mum was determined I went to university and I did a, a degree course in communications. Um, because that's all I could do in Ireland at the time. There was two courses that were available. Um, and I loved it and I had a great time. And it was fantastic and marvellous. Um, and I did TV production, photography and radio production. Um, I didn't need to have maths for that. And, and I understand what you guys are saying about your benchmarks. I get that. And that's lovely and that's great. Um, but we have a massive skill shortage. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we need people to come out of university or or not go to university and that's a topic of discussion and we need them to have certain skills so so as as Todd and I, as a small company we decided to start off graduate scheme we did a graduate scheme for very many reasons one of them was because we wanted people to come out with a certain skill set that we could then take and then mold nobody comes out of university being able to do a job they think they can but we all know that's rubbish <laughs> so so we took them on and 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 it's been really really successful but but as someone who goes through all the CVs of those graduates, I, I, I look at it and I go, right, well, that's great. You guys have almost filtered half of the diverse population out already because I've got, you know, 66% of the majority white men or boys, but I don't think I'm allowed to say that. But anyway, so, so it, it's kind of like, so my, my question to you guys is, um, I get you need your progress, prerequisites, do we need to have different courses? Do we need to change the title of those jobs? Because I need people. And you guys are giving me people, yeah. but you're giving me just this small section of society. And, and, and just like Bob was saying earlier, what we do is we problem solve. Yeah. And, and one life experience is not going to give us the diverse approach to problem solving. And so, you know, whatever you decide to call it, I really don't care. I just want people. <laughs> no, I, I, I. <laughs> so, my course doesn't actually have any prerequisites. Marvellous. Um, <laughs> we aren't accredited by the IET, and if we were to go down that route, we, we would probably need to change that. Um, but at the moment, we have the, the general kind of, you know, you have to get certain grades. Um, but actually, even if you don't meet those grades, we've got a foundation year, so you can come on um, to that and do that year first and get yourself up to kind of standard in whatever it is. It might be a math, it might be English, um, and then you can start our course um, a year later. Now, that does sometimes put people off because that's an extra year, it's an extra year of funding, but it's also an extra way in. Um, my, <laughs> the amount of students I have applying is still really low. So even though I don't have those prerequisites, I still can't get the people in. So I don't think it's um, that that's putting them off my so what, course. What do, you think, what do you think is putting them off? I that? don't <clears throat> think they know what we do. Yeah. I just don't think anybody understands what a vision engineer is at 18 years old when they're applying for a university course, mm -hmm. or 17 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, I imagine that's the type of people you're wanting. You're wanting tech ops, you're wanting vision engineers, you're wanting mm -hmm. broadcast engineers, you're wanting people with computing knowledge that can go and build IP networks that run systems like this and you know <clears throat> I've kind of changed some of the ways we've just redesigned our courses to try and get more people in and I've retitled them for the millionth time <laughs> and I think I've got even less applications oh, no. as, a, as a result of those retitles and they just I had that conversation earlier about you retitled last year and had a similar yeah. issue Absolutely, yeah. um, and that's why I think things like what Carrie's doing is really yes. really important because we need people to understand what everybody round there and in there <clears throat> is doing yeah. and then that will make a difference. Carrie, do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
anybody that's had this conversation with me before will know that I always say that the real problem is that nobody's heard of us at all. It's not that they misunderstand what, what we do, or that they're put off by what we do and don't really like the sound of it, or even that they've got to the front door and gone, oh, maths and physics. <laughs> <laughs> they just have no idea that we exist. That's the problem, and again, that is why schools-based initiatives are so important, because we can't rely on the rest of the STEM sector to represent us because a lot of them also don't know that we exist. So if we don't talk about what we do, which is what we hate doing, um, people will not know that we exist and we won't have any new shiny engineers. Yeah. Um, okay. I did a bit of research. Um, and um, I, uh, 40, apparently, 46.4% of all girls between 11 and 14 would consider a career in engineering, okay? That, that's the stat. But... Only 21% of women work in the engineering sector. So there's a massive drop off there. I don't know, how do we get those 11, 40, and 11 to 14 year olds into, into universities and then ending up doing what you guys do? Uh, I don't know, I, I had something like I carried that. So at 12, I had a video workshop. And since I knew I wanted to work as an engineer in the broadcast industry. Mm -hmm. So probably with some initiative like that, it will help all the women and any people from the diversity to go in this industry because I was coming from the south of France. There is no broadcast over there. I didn't know anybody working in television, but I knew from this day that I will be an engineer in broadcast. Should we move on then to um, what the benefits of learning on the job as an engineer is? You know, touching upon what you what you were mentioning their machine. So let's start with the main benefit that, that you think that you get, because we've all learned on the job, even if we've gone yes. to university or not, and we're all still learning, it doesn't matter how old you are, right? So what if you went straight into engineering, learning from the job, what are the benefits? I think you get, it's just hands-on. I mean, I, I come from post world and people generally start off as a runner making tea and then they move their way up. And I mean, I went to university because it was great crack and I got drunk for three years. And, <laughs> And that was great. And, and it taught me how to do my washing and to turn up on time for things. And, and, and all of that stuff is, is brilliant and valuable. And I'm not saying don't go to university because we need really, really clever people who do, who do really, really clever things in this industry. Um, but not everybody is academic. And I, 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 a lot of people ask me this question, should I go to university or should I just start off as a runner on minimum wage? And, and I really struggle with it because it, is, it does depend on what you want to do. And there's loads of new apprenticeship schemes out there, which you were talking about, and, and, and we're looking to try to start one off. Um, apprenticeship schemes are brilliant, um, and, and we don't take enough advantage of the apprentice levy that we, a lot of companies are paying into, and we're, we're not taking advantage of that. So the government is getting lots of... I think the term that was used recently was they're getting lots of fabulous hairdressers, um, <laughs> but we're not getting other people out of this industry because... Nobody knows about us. Um, and it is really hard because part of our job is to make sure nobody knows we exist. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I always say nobody wants to see an engineer coming. You, you just don't. <laughs> you, you, you really don't. Especially during a live production. That means that's bad. Um, but but we, have to start, we have to start somewhere. And, and, and obviously, Carrie's initiative is fantastic. But that's going to take years. So, yeah. so we need to do something now. I mean, we needed to do it ages ago, but we didn't because we were too busy um, thinking we're all fabulous. But we need to do something now. And, and so for me, I'm saying to a lot of young people, sort of get yourself a job as a runner. Get in there. Get, 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 get a, a, don't get yourself a massive amount of debt. Just get in and get working. And if you decide later on that you want to get that degree, then, then do it through a company or... or, or do open university or whatever um, because number one I'm selfish and it's all about me and I need people and <laughs> and number two because they can learn and not everybody is academic but the people that we need and the people we need right now are the people who know how to build a little app on their iPhone and 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 they know that at like 14 you know I know that at five exactly <laughs> it's, it's disturbing <laughs> and and one of the great things we have in the industry at the moment is that we're almost getting to a stage where we're kind of on a level playing field because there is so much new stuff that if you're a not saying this is the truth at all, but if you happen to be a 50-year-old pot-bellied bald man 
you know pretty much the same thing as a 20-year-old who has been doing computing courses at secondary school and everything, and so something comes in, and it's going to be some hardware with a bit of software on the top, and you have to work out how to make it work. You can, you can, you can do that. Can I, can I can I suggest something on that? If it was 20 years ago when you just have to hook up an encoder and a transmitter and it would work, that's not the case now. Everything is IP based and imagine in a live stream if you configure one IP address incorrectly because you calculated it wrong, nothing would work. So that's why there must be some benchmark and certain criteria. Not for entry necessarily, but over the period you have to develop that competence in order to be able to stream live, you know, in order to be able to send things to the cloud and then revert them back. For in, in jest, you need some people who are competent enough. So to develop that competency, it is very important to have that standard. So it is not just being an academic or just being an engineer. It is a combination of the two. Second thing is, if we look at the numbers, at primary school, boys and girls are taught together. Secondary schools, they are taught together and there is no discrimination as such. Yet, there are more girls going to the university uh, compared to men, but they are choosing non-technical subjects. That is purely cultural, not, nothing to do with academics as such. Because I think when we, at school level, we pinkify everything, uh, I would say that pinkification process actually changes the whole concept of where women should go. And they go, oh, tech is not for us. So they don't get into computing, they don't get into any engineering related subjects, so hence the figure of 21%. I looked at figures of other countries where the pinkification is comparatively less. So in China and India, in technical subjects, it is virtually 50% women getting into those fields. So maybe we need to change, if we can't show the people behind the scenes or unsung heroes, at least in front of the screen we can improve or project that. What are those nations doing differently to what we're doing then? Uh, I think the, it is more of cultural where we are saying, oh, technical is not for me or not for women. We are, they don't glamorize. Uh, just the front end, in front of the glass, what is happening. Uh, they are showing the importance. In those countries, I think it is a matter of survival as well, for everyone equally. And when they realize uh, engineering is a well-paid field, it is well-respected, you still behind the scenes can earn equal respect and equal money, or even better at times, they definitely go for it. But here, because of that element of security, I think, um, People don't go for this type of areas. Uh, they, they think oh, we are still secure. We can still. They want the world to revolve around them, so they want to stay within their comfort zone. Many times they don't want to be challenged. So that's why 45% of women who come into technical field they leave after a year or within a year's time. That is purely because they want things to revolve around them rather than them adjusting to the uh, very demanding field in the tech industry. Does Dr. Ali have valid points? I. I I do. I, I think. I think, though. I think that's beautiful, but <laughs> but you know, it's. And I, I can only talk about broadcast. So, so engineering, I'm not going to talk about. Um, I, I'm talking about this little world of mine. It's a beautiful little world. Um, and what I would say is, we have to make sure. So, when I mean, Charlotte mentioned it. You know, we have to understand that it is a male-dominated industry, and and until we change it, it will be. So. When you walk into that room full of a whole pile of aging yeah. gentlemen, mm -hmm. then it can be intimidating. And, you know, I, I, I remember saying to one of our young graduates, um, I, I, one of her first weeks here, I ultimately do not want her to have to become someone like me. Mm. And, and I'm, I'm fabulous, but, <laughs> but what I don't want, I don't want... I don't want people to have to come into this industry and as a woman be, um, you know, and we've all mentioned it, you know, I don't want to have to, them to, her to be, have to be 60 times better than everybody else. I don't want to have to, her to have to fight all of those stupid little battles where people assume that she's stupid. Um, and I don't want to do any of that. And I don't want, I don't want her to think for a second that, you know, she, in a certain instance, she's not good enough. Now, thankfully, our female graduates are pretty feisty young people, mm -hmm. which is great, um, but, and they need to be, but they shouldn't have to be. And, and I suppose, you know, this is a, a, a debate between educators and, and, and uh, engineers. We're not saying, I'm not saying I don't want people to go to university. I do. I just want the people that come out of the university to be the people I want to employ. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the difference. Um, and, and, and we're not getting that. For, for all of the very valid reasons, that 
we need to help you guys as much as you guys need to help us. Um, but we definitely, definitely all need to change our attitudes because it, it's not working. Yeah. We do have 50-50% on our intake. We've got 50% girls and guys over the last three years. So we've got those students there. But as Polly was saying, we just don't have a great deal of students coming in, knowing about it in the first place. And I think training on the job is brilliant. I'm, I'm from the BBC, so although I did the graduate degree programme and a direct entry engineer, I was working along with absolutely amazing people who were being trained by the BBC. Now we know that the BBC doesn't have the money to do that on the scale that it did in the past, so it's great that other companies can take on apprenticeships in some way. But you do also end up with the, the scenario like Charlie had earlier, that you know she's live trying to you know, do something saying, oh go on, go on, you can do it, and she's going, oh no, hopefully they get that chance at university, if you if you choose the right course, you get operational um, information. You get the chance to try things out where it's not a live program. You get the chance to make the mistakes. You get the chance to learn from experts around you, so that when you do then make it into industry, you won't be quite so nervous for quite so long. Hopefully, you'll be say, "No, I've seen this done before. I want to. I want to do it." So hopefully, that's what we do and what we inspire in young people. Give them the give them that safe environment to actually learn some of the skills that they actually need, and then can use in industry. But do you think that going to, to do engineering in uni um, gives women, you know, that edge in 2020? Do you, do you think... Do you, do you oh, it definitely gives them the edge. I mean, I've got a graduate here who was the only female graduate from our broadcast engineering course last year. She came to the last SVG meeting as a recent graduate and she secured a job, I think, as the basis from that, that last meet-up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it definitely gives you an edge. But she's the last female. I don't have a female in the third year. I don't have a female in the second year. And I've got a couple in the first year. But they lack confidence. And I'm going to have to really, really nurture them to make sure that they finish their degree. And then they come to you. And they want to work with you. And it, and it be OK. Um, so yeah, that's a, that, that is a real issue for me. But they, yeah, they have the edge. Um, but I was going to ask um, Roshan what... The, you're saying that you're not getting what you need. Is that just numbers, or is it skills, or is it both? Or you know, it, uh, I have to be really careful because I've got some of my graduates here, and they're lovely, <laughs> and they're wonderful, <laughs> and they're fabulous. Um, but it, 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 it's um, t I'm going to give you a non someone who we didn't employ. Okay, yeah. so oh we have a graduate day because we want to get to know them. We realise that interviews are quite horrible and nasty, and, and when you've just come out of university, that's a little bit. <laughs> we basically spend a day talking rubbish with them, just just to see, you know, just to, just to get to know them a little bit, and it's, and it's great. Um, but a section of it is a little formal interview, more for practice, just see how they are under stress. Um, but the first question somebody asked me um, when they walked in, they went. Oh, this is great. So if you, if you work here, so I get to do selfies with Gary Lineker. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, well, I'm going to employ you, aren't I? <laughs> right, I've got to sit here for 20 minutes talking absolute rubbish to someone I don't want to spend any more time with. Now, I'm not saying that's, that's up to you. I think that's parents and just basic cop on in life. Um, but when we get young people in, and, and, and I will use one of our great graduates uh, and and she had done this amazing big drawing of an OB truck and it, and it was wonderful and now I know she, and then I knew she could use AutoCAD and I was like this is rocking we'll have that steal that um, but it's that understanding and and that this is brilliant and you know lots but the unfortunate reality about the technical industry in my experience is it doesn't always make sense you do have to learn it all the time and it's so especially here it's so agile and so dynamic so you talk about the safety of learning and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, I'm more of a, a bob. I'm like, come here, learn this, get on with it. Just because of time and also because when you're an engineer, you're not just learning technology, you're learning more and more. Our engineers, they're behind the camera, but they're also dealing with the, the, the gems of this world. They're, they're, they're dealing with you know, the presenters. And you have to know how to deal with people. Mm -hmm. you know, at BT have a wonderful development team who, who have, wear white coats and you know, <laughs> are in darkened rooms. And they're great, and they don't have to you know, be able to communicate with people, and that's fine. But, <laughs> but our engineers do, because, yeah, because that's part of the job now. 
you know, it, it is. Yeah, it so is. personality then is almost more, just as important, if not more so, than, than actually... Yeah. You're not going to be able to figure out how to solve a problem if you can't understand what it is that somebody's trying to tell you is the problem. Yeah. Because they won't know. This button doesn't light up. It, it's fault finding. Yeah. It's using your initiative. It's, it's all the common sense skills. That's the word. <laughs> if you could make people with common sense, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. God, life would be great. It's a special yeah. module from the court. Yeah. Interestingly, <laughs> across the Thank board, you. if we look at the top 10 skills in demand, all, all 10 are soft skills, basically, mm -hmm. communication and project management, self-organization, et cetera, et cetera. I think the solution to this problem could be initiatives like RISE, I would say. I think Kerry is doing a great job. But doing it at a primary school level, it is better to do it when the children are taking a decision to choose a field, a particular sector. So maybe at secondary school or even mm -hmm. students doing GCAA levels at that stage. Uh, we are talking about role models, I think very inspirational talks uh, from, from everyone. At that stage, uh, they don't understand the role models as much. They're more of Instagram youth, Instagram generation, I would say. So if we communicate with them using their language, it might be more suitable for them to read and understand, yes, there are careers. So the role models and this type of initiatives should go using the social media and these modern techniques. Mm -hmm. And that will reach out eventually and people will consider, yes, there is a field that I don't know about, so maybe I need to explore. Maybe run some small workshops uh, at uh, A-level uh, stage where, where they are choosing their pathways. And don't pinkify it, oh, this is an easy way and this is the difficult way of doing things. It is all equal. So we are struggling with acute shortage of broadcast engineer, regardless of gender or race or anything. So it should be neurodiversity. We should have people from all types of backgrounds and mindsets. It should be uh, ethnic diversity. We should have people from all walks of life. And it should be a gender diversity as well at the same time. And I think that is the only way forward if we have to address this in the next few years. Yeah. I've come across one association called UK Filmnet. It's, it, it seems to be quite new on the, in, on the scene. And his ambition is to train, teach schools and get teaching materials into schools that include all the technical skills, as opposed to, I think, on the curriculum, they've even reduced some of the practical skills that they do in media studies. So any skills that students were getting at, at sort of A-level, they're getting 20% less than that of practical skills now. So he's providing, I think it's about 500 master videos um, uh, amazing sort of Oscar winners and people talking about lighting, people talking about sound engineering, so that the people at school level, even though they don't have that information, because um, someone who is teaching a film critique course or media studies possibly doesn't have that knowledge themselves. But these videos will enable anyone to actually learn from it and, and understand that there's more to it than what you see just on front of the camera. So I'm quite excited that that is happening now. He's trying to launch this in the next uh, few months. So and it's UK Filmnet. UK Filmnet. Cass, did you want to say something before I open it up to the floor? Yeah, I, think, I think it's quite easy <clears throat> in a discussion like this for us to make quite big blanket statements about what people <clears throat> traditionally don't like or do like doing or... Um, whether one thing is a, is a really beneficial way to get into the industry and another thing isn't, or maybe there are multiple ways. But even when we talk about the term broadcast engineer, that is a huge blanket statement in its own right. Because what I do and what Ella, who's on sound at the back, or what somebody on an OB does are all very, very different roles and very different disciplines. And I work with other design engineers who have a lot of infrastructure expertise, and that's what they know, and I look a lot at emerging technologies and at video quality and that's mostly what I know, I care about pictures. Um, and so we, we need all sorts. <laughs> um, and we need people that like maths and physics. Um, I don't think that's a boundary to be avoided. I think that's a problem that has to be solved. We need people that don't really like maths and physics but are critical thinkers. Yes. We need people that like maths and physics and are critical thinkers and can talk to people. Yes. Um, <laughs> when, when you find them. <laughs> That's a really nice end, actually, to throw it up and to open it up to you guys. Um, have you guys got any questions that you'd like to... Oh, lots. Um, OK, we'll start with the gentleman in the grey. As an industry, we're very... We'll just get a microphone, too, so wait a minute, just for, to make sure we all hear you. 
as an industry, we're very self-absorbed and narcissistic, I think we'll all agree. <laughs> and do you think that that's actually part of the problem, that we, we're we asking for things and people, and there is an, a, a, a definite skill shortage in the industry, but we're not really going out and selling ourselves as an industry, are we? As an engineering function. You know, it's like you say, we sell the front of the camera and we sell the glabber, mm -hmm. but we don't really, we don't do a good job of selling our industry mm -hmm. to girls and boys to a large mm -hmm. extent. And I sit here as a father of two young girls and I see an amazing, amazingly talented panel of educators, an amazingly talented panel of engineers, but I see a lot of silo thinking going on. I th I th for me, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think half of, as, as I was saying, half of it is as, as a, a broadcasting device on the telly box, we don't want to see the OB truck out the back in the piss and rain. You don't want to see that. That's not nice. That's not glamorous. That's not good. You don't want to see uh, the engineers in a room with, you know, a soldering iron out and stuff like that. You don't want to see that. that that's not pretty. Um, but you know you need a teacher. You know you need a doctor, you know you need a nurse. Um, I, I say these because I'm Irish and that's the job opportunities. Right <laughs> um, and, and, but we, you're right, we don't. Um, I always think, though, we say that people don't know these jobs exist. Uh, and again, come from Ireland, one of the first programmes, just ill. First programme ever to show a camera on telly was the Late Late Show in, in, in Ireland. That was the first time they ever showed a camera that... Actually, this isn't magic happening on the box. Um, <laughs> and people go out there and they shoot stuff on their iPhones and everything. And so, so we do do things like, for example, we have, um, we have apps where we get fans to feedback stuff. You know, um, people do know that they're in studios. Um, people aren't stupid. I, you're right. We don't go out there and say, look, at this is a job. But I don't think a chemical analyst goes out there and says, look, this is a job either. You, you know, we need to be better. There's no question. We need to be better. And I think um, absolutely things like Rise Up and, and, and getting into schools and all that and saying, look, we're here. But I think this is happening with a lot of industries. Um, but our industry, I think, suffers a lot from the fact that everybody knows about TV, but they don't want to think about the messy bit. They want to think. They want to think about her. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't want to think about me. Because, you know, that's, that's the vision of TV. That's what we sell. And that's what, that's, that's what we want to sell. That's what people pay to subscribe to. So, you know. Um, but yeah, you're right. We do. We do. Um, Thank you. I'm just wondering, sorry. I'm just asking you, so how, how, do you, how would you suggest that, that, you know, we sell an industry that, that you can't see? How, how do you suggest that you sell that to your two young well, daughters? Well, uh, the people who know me here, I, I'm behind the camera. I'm a production manager, you know, so I never wanted to have your job. That would terrify the hell out. I'm like I can do your I'm job. I'm like Charlotte, basically. You know, I like to be behind the scenes. And I think we all know that people that get into our industry behind the camera love it and have a great life. Absolutely. I think we need to communicate that better. I think we need to, in the nicest possible way, we need to sell the positives of it, which are... You get out, you meet people, you travel. You know, I've done stuff in my sporting career, working for Sky and working for Dolby, that I could only dream of when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's up to people like us to go out and sell the dream that is working behind the camera. I and don't, I don't think we do it no, very well. You have, to, you, have to, you have to go to the university to <laughs> talk to them. Yes, to talk I'd to scare the them. kids. <laughs> right. I know, and, and I, I, you're right, but... but and, and a lot of people come in as broadcast engineers and they want to go on OBs, and that's one of my problems as well. They want to leave me. <laughs> I know you're thinking that's shocking, but they do. Um, and you're right, we do need to do that. Look at all the business And points. the final thing I, I would say in answer to your question, Sarah, is I think as an industry, we need to be more open and flexible to what the next generation and what the current generation want out of their careers. So I'll give you an example. We talk about women. I know people that have been in the industry have been great engineers, have been great production managers. As soon as they have children, they find it very difficult to enter back into that yeah, industry work, yeah. because our industry is very good at saying to people, we want you 100% mm -hmm. and mothers... But that's true of a front of a camera as well, yeah. I think. And they yeah, say, well, I, I can't give you 100% anymore. I, I've got newborn children. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can't we work weekends? Oh, I'm really sorry. So I think as an industry... We, we go out there and we say what we want, 
but we actually have to be a lot more adaptable and actually go out and ask the next generation what they want from a job rather than you know rather than saying to them this is what we want from you we need to say to them this is what we need but what do you need from us and we're not very good at that we're not very good at asking people what they want from us we just say well we've got a shortage of engineers we need people and everybody goes okay well how do we address that but actually i think we need to be more open mm -hmm. both gender diversity but also in terms of work-life balance because let's be honest all of us in this room we all know that broadcasting is not the most uh, balanced work-life balance shall i say well, that, so, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, industry because in australia for example the life balance in the broadcast industry is still good so it's more a country issue or a mentality in the country more than the industry itself. We, we also do job sharing. So I had two brilliant female engineers and I wanted to keep them. So they need to do a job share. I went, great, let's do that then. So we can be flexible. <laughs> yeah. Need to be more flexible. Very good point. Very good point. Um, okay, who else has a question for us? Anyone? Come over here. We've got a few over this side of the room. Right Can you introduce yourself, please, to us as well? Uh, hello, uh, Edward Harvey. I'm uh, the father of two children, and uh, I work at Timeline and have been in the industry for about 25, 26 years now. Um, I'm absolutely passionate about the industry, and I absolutely love it. Um, but I do feel that sometimes we're sort of pigeonholing. You know, it's a super exciting f business that we're in, and. <laughs> Sometimes the word engineering, engineers are fabulous because they deliver the solutions and they deliver creativity. I don't often feel, feel those two things are placed together. Mm -hmm. You know, creativity is often talked about producers and presenters and formats and that sort of thing. What the engineering team and what the facility providers, all of us on the other side, create solutions. We're constantly delivering solutions for a format idea and let's be honest a lot of us have sat there and a producer has brought an idea to us they have no idea how to actually turn it into into real life and that's what we do we're as creative as everybody else and i think one of the most important things is that when we're talking to potential people let's forget about the the gender side of it engineering technology those sorts of things can define who you're then going to talk to. But actually what you want to talk about is the creativity and technical uh, creativity that is on the facility side. Now, a lot of people at home, youngsters, look at television, look at media, look at broadcasting as, yes, in front of the camera. I don't think we as... I'm going to say facility providers. There's a divide. There's a production side and there's a facility side. And I think there's a facility side, and this ties in with universities as well, is we need to promote the creativity in the facility side. The group of those facility providers are a whole mixture of people like me who know a tiny little bit about a lot of things, and th people think I've got a lot of engineering knowledge, and I have next to none. <laughs> versus some other engineers who I would absolutely never want to go on a live show with, without. But at the same time, do you know what? You do that. Please don't talk to an exec producer yeah. because you're totally fantastic at what you're doing and I'm pretty good at well, what I do too. Well, that's coming back to what you were saying, Callis, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, but do you know what? We are absolutely creative. And I think mm -hmm. the focus for me is to talk about people, talk to youngsters about the creativity on the other side of the camera. Mm -hmm. If they tap into that, I... I Okay, so I know I'm going on a little bit, but, you know... <laughs> you can come and sit here if you want. Okay. That's what I've, got, I've got one fabulous example, and it, he, he still makes me proud of what I did, what we did 20 years ago. I had a, a runner who had no desire to be an editor, had no relationship, no knowledge about that, and said to me, and I said, listen, we're working in post-production, why don't you go and sit with the editors for a couple of days? And do you know what? He turned around and said, well, why do I want to go and sit in a dark room? You know, what's all that about? I sent him, a, I, I, I just said, go and do it. He came back and he went, oh my God, it's not about pressing the buttons. As an editor, you tell a story. Mm. And I went, bang, you've got it. 
he's actually has to be very technical because he's got to press those buttons, he's got to understand time code, he's got to understand ISOs and all those sorts of things. But he's also got to be creative. And, and he is now an entertainment headline editor. And I always regale his story because it's an example of technical knowledge associated with creativity associated with, I don't know what that's all about. Go and touch it, go and feel it and find out. Do you push creativity in, in, in your university courses? You do. Okay. Absolutely. It's a, it tends to be about just under 50% on the course. We do cinematography, we do storytelling, uh, we get the students to use the cameras because if they are going to be an engineer on set and deal with someone stressing, they need to know when not to go and interfere. Mm -hmm. And then they need to say, I need to take that away to fix it. You'll get it back. <laughs> so understanding the production side is very, very important. And it also gives them the freedom that once they actually graduate, once they go into the real world, world, they're more likely to get a job if they have technical skills. And then if they want to spread their wings into the editing, the, the other side of creativity, then they're already in the industry and it's slightly easier to move once you're established in that industry. So it's kind of win-win giving them this. Yeah. Okay, so let's just have one final question. I think there's a lady... Is it, so this is... Um, oh, this someone's is, got the mic already. I can't yeah, see this, you. There you go. This, this is the question for Karis um, and for Sandy. So you guys are obviously broadcast engineers who are now well-established in, in the industry. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into it and then what's keeping you in it? What's the inspiration to stay in broadcast? <laughs> <laughs> For me, so I started with a video workshop at 12 and since I knew I wanted to be a broadcast engineer, so I did a master degree in, with math, physics and video. Um, and then so I had a job uh, placement and then I got my job after that. Um, and I keep going. I travel to Australia, to Southeast Asia, to a lot of customers. And what I like is uh, the live is to, we cannot make a mistake during a big event. And we can make mistake before, but not doing it. <laughs> so we have to make sure like we are on the top of our skills during the event. What's keeping you in it? What's keeping you in the industry? This is this feeling is uh, adrenaline. adrenaline. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I um, grew up in a very small North Wales town. Um, didn't know what an engineer was. Where? In, just outside of Bala. Ah, Bala. Yeah, no well. Do you speak Welsh? <laughs> oh, we could have done all this in Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, guys. Carry on. So I can also use my, like, despite being educated in Welsh, hashtag. That's great. Um, I had a slightly bizarre amount of live sound chucked into my childhood, which I always enjoyed. Um, never mind messing with a computer. I didn't code or anything, but I didn't mind computers. Um, and I was also involved in stage lighting when I was in high school. So I, li I liked, I guess, what you would call tech ops um, type problem solving and the rush that you get when you're doing a, a live theatre production or whatever it is. I also liked a bit of photography, um, but I also liked maths and physics. I was never really told that I couldn't do it. I liked getting my head around it. Um, in, I enjoyed solving a problem. So when I had a freakishly good piece of careers advice where my careers advisor said you could be a pilot or you could think about going to television, I then started looking for television courses that allowed me not to waste my ability to digest theory. So I enjoyed the production, but I didn't want to not use my brain as I saw it at the time. I wanted to find something that met in the middle, which meant that I naturally ended up, after quite a lot of looking, on a media te technology course or a broadcast engineering degree. And when you look back, that was the obvious choice for me. But when I went to uni, I did not know what a broadcast engineer was. I hadn't heard of it, and yet I was on a broadcast engineering degree. Mm -hmm. And I was excited by the time I left uni about the new technologies and about improving pictures for normal people in the home. And funnily enough, that's the kind of part of the industry that I've ended up working in and I'm still there because I'm invested in it and I'm still there because I enjoy what I do and I still enjoy solving a problem. Um, yeah. That's good. I really enjoyed that panel discussion. Thank you so much. Guys. <laughs>
<laughs> so let's have another round of applause then. Um, thank you very much to Roisin, to Sandy and to Callis and uh, um, engineers Polly, uh, Susan and Dr Ali, the educators on the other side as well. Congratulations. Thank you guys.